Uh, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I'd just like to introduce myself, Scott Morris from Australia, and I wish to thank very much WIPO, the Van der Law School, the US Performing Right Organizations, uh, for organizing this and for inviting me also to speak. Uh, we have a very distinguished panel of friends and colleagues here um, from essentially from the region, from the Americas, and I say probably that I'm nearly included in that because, of course, Australia and New Zealand, we're the 53rd state over, you know, beyond Hawaii over there. So I think what we're going to talk about now is to follow on some of the threads of conversation we've had about different models and the different ways collective management has been organized and developed in, in various territories. And certainly in terms of how rights are administered, how the rights are granted, how uh, collecting societies are overseen by their governments in respective countries, and how the international system works. Uh, so hopefully it will prompt um, some more heated debate about uh, rights administration here, and it will give you another context in which to, to view the developments that are happening here in the United States. Um, I note also there was a question earlier from the Philippines, and um, part of the theme is um, what are the challenges and problems that face uh, collective management organizations in developing countries? And certainly over the last 10 years, I've had a little bit of experience uh, with this in the context of the Asia-Pacific Committee of CSAC, the International Confederation of Authors and Composers, whereby um, CSAC has regional committees that assist with the establishment and development of copyright collective management organizations of various um, genres and repertoires um, in, in the respective uh, regions. And I know that in the case of the Philippines, it has been a long and difficult and slow development of the local society fields camp. And indeed, part of the solidarity that CSAC offers is not only training, preparing training materials and assisting the society, but also in some of the more difficult negotiations that nascent societies in those developing countries face. And I'm thinking in particular of the very difficult negotiations that have taken place over the last you know, 20 or so years in the Philippines against the broadcasters in particular the television and radio broadcasters, who have, in fact, um, very large and substantial political influence and power. And the difficulty we had in terms of actually securing any remuneration at all for authors in Phil's Cap is a difficult thing. So I want to talk also a little bit about the proposal about is it a good thing perhaps that there should be separate breakaway societies countries such as the Philippines. And I think um, that if we look back to the beginning of collective administration, if we go back to 1850 on the Champs-Élysées and the Café des Ambassadeurs where there were three composers who decided the only way that they could enforce their economic rights was to band together. And it was only through the solidarity that the first collecting society was established in France. And it's that same solidarity that is really important in terms of confronting large major user, users, particularly in developing countries where broadcasters often have a lot of political influence and power by the very nature of the broadcast media itself, of course, and its involvement in the political process. Um, but I think, you know, in terms of, you know, developing society, solidarity is really important. Solidarity locally, for all the rights holders of all the various genres. And if there is any publishing interest, for example, that the publishers also are on board. But more importantly also, the solidarity between the international repertoire and the local repertoire. That is the only effective way that you will establish any kind of rights administration on behalf of composers, authors, and publishers if we're talking musical works. So I think, you know, really, Another aspect to, to copyright societies in developing countries is the role of government and what sort of oversight the government should have in terms of ensuring the efficiency, the transparency of that society. And therefore, if you have you know, complaints about um, 
not knowing whether or not you're being paid correctly, they should be able to be taken up with the, the society directly. And also, you know, to lobby people who are the representative board, board members who represent the relevant rights holders um, concerned. But I think that, you know, what we're, we're witnessing perhaps now in Europe, and in some cases, you know, uh, what is happening in America sometimes, is the fragmentation of the rights mean that it's a, a lot more difficult for rights holders to actually establish any kind of licensing regime at all. And I'm thinking, you know, if you think about certain members, for example, major publishers withdrawing digital rights um, from societies, as is proposed in Europe. If you look at what happened in China, for example, where uh, there was a collecting society set up over, well over 10 years ago, um, which had commenced licensing some of the massive volumes of businesses which uh, exist in China online and for mobile environments. And there, the, the publishers decided to withdraw their rights and try and do direct deals with other third parties. And as a result, we've seen that effectively nobody is now able to license some of these major mega users, such as China Telecom, Baidu, and some of the other massive users that exist in China. So I think, you know, I'm, I'm singing the old song of Zizak, but it, it's a very sweet song. And I think that's the song of solidarity, really. That's the only way we can go forward. So, um, and I suppose uh, coming from the point of view of a society that administers both performing and mechanical rights and is in a situation that we are the only society in our territory. We are, however, subject to very stringent government controls on a number of levels. And that goes to ensure the absolute transparency of all of our operations, of all of our collections, of all of our distribution pools, uh, our, our efficiency, that our costs are kept low, that our, we are accountable to all of our members, uh, both publishers, writers, and of different genres, that um, we have uh, a number of different controls. In the first place, we have... <coughs> excuse me. Um, we have to authorise our input and output arrangements with the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission every four years, where they analyse all of our performance, all of our operations, our transparency and efficiency, um, and then they decide whether or not it, uh, the overwhelming public interest is to have a single society, uh, and whether or not the public interest in having that transparency and efficiency and missing out on the duplication of transaction and licensing costs in terms of documentation and securing licenses, whether those public benefits outweigh um, for any possible uh, detrimental effects on a competition level. And you know, thus far in the two authorization hearings we've had, we have satisfied our competition authority that that is the case. We're also subject to uh, what is called a, a collecting society code of conduct, which supervises all of our dealings with members and licensees in terms of assessing how we deal with any complaints, queries that, that we receive. And the other more important, I suppose, um, supervision is in terms of determining tariffs. And that is done by a copyright tribunal, which is um, set up under our Copyright Act, which is an independent specialist judicial body that determines rates where we cannot agree on a negotiated settlement between user groups and the society. So I suppose that's how it operates in Australia uh, and New Zealand and the English-speaking Pacific, which are all the territories that we maintain uh, mandated to us under our reciprocal agreements around the world. And um, so... I suppose, uh, what else was I going to say? The other th important issue I think that we, we can learn a bit more about from the, the members of the panel is how societies can also cooperate in terms of IT. You know, IT, of course, now is one of our biggest costs in terms of, particularly in the digital era, with having to, to process the huge volume of performance data the, the millions of work that we represent both locally and through our international um, organizations. 
And it's also important that all of our societies are able to uh, adopt all of the, the common information standards that are set by CESA to ensure that there is efficient and transparent uh, documentation of international repertoire around the world and that we exchange that information um, on, on an efficient basis. Um, in terms of uh, the mechanical, the, the history of, of APRA and AMCOS, I think we share a lot perhaps with Canada and we'll hear a little bit more about that from our, our Canadian representative on the panel. I mean, APRA was established in 1926, just before uh, the advent of radio in Australia and New Zealand. And we have licensed uh, all major users ever since. AMCOS is the mechanical rights organization, which is an agency owned and controlled by the publishers, somewhat similar to Harry Fox. However, in 1997, the boards of APRA and AMCOS decided to enter into an operational alliance to save on transaction costs in terms of developing new IT platforms and systems to be ready for digital administration of, of the rights and musical works, to also ensure that we can issue single joint licenses, because of course that's what users want. Users, as we've heard earlier, aren't that interested in whether this is a performing right, how much that is worth, and the, and the mechanical right. They really do want to have a license that covers the rights that, that relates to their service. So having that operational alliance in place has allowed us to develop a whole stream of licenses that cover both communication rights, incorporating, making works available on the internet, transmission, and reproduction rights in the various forms that all of these digital services incorporate. And I know there's still ongoing debate and discussion here about the characterization of the rights. But I suppose in most territories outside of the United States, you know, the umbrella uh, solution wasn't really applicable because in most cases we adopted Article 8 in terms of saying, yes, uh, online tr transmission and making available a part of the communication to the public rights. And I think you'll hear perhaps that, that in, in a lot of these other territories they'll share similar situations in terms of cooperating to, to, to issue joint licenses that cover all the rights required on online services. We also have a number of other collecting societies in Australia, of course. In 1969, the record company set up our, our Neighbouring Rights Collective because under our law in 1968, uh, rights of public performance and broadcast were granted to record producers and owners of copyright and sound recordings. Um, and that is now shared, of course. The, the company is still only controlled by the record companies, but it does distribute 50% to performers. Not sure whether or not it yet has an agreement with Sound Exchange. I expect it is a bit fearful of having to pay um, for, for a great number of American performers. But um, I might now just uh, hand it over because I think there'll be a lot of questions, and later I'd like to perhaps even field questions about. Uh, developing countries and the activities that we're undertaking, particularly in the Asia-Pacific region. But I might um, come closer to home now and talk about um, how copyright collective management has developed in Latin America. And I might now introduce my colleague, Santiago Schuster, who is the Director General of La Sociedad Chilena de Derecho de Autor, SCD, and uh, who does some fantastic work, not only on behalf of music copyright holders, but in terms of copyright holders generally in Chile and South America. And he's got a PowerPoint, so we might all sit down here and enjoy the show for a minute. Thanks, Santiago. Thank you very much, Scott, for your introduction. And thank you to WIPO and uh, this wonderful university for inviting to us to this uh, uh, forum. And, um, and of course, ISAC, our confederation. Um, first of all, I would like to, to tell you that uh, I am a survivor uh, from the Sevilla Forum because I was uh, there 10 years ago, and in that time, my friend 
Michael Fichter and Patrick Massoyer uh, may, uh, did a wonderful work to, to convocate all the people in, 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 in the collective administration, in non, not only in copyrights, in neighboring rights also. And I remember that in that time, all the people announced in the audience that the collective administration, the collective administration is dying. And then we are here again talking about uh, collective administration. And, uh, but sometimes I heard that maybe we are talking again about that uh, copyright is dying. Well, in my presentation, I only want to illustrate about our work in Latin America. I'm coming from a very young society, a 20 years old society, the Chilean Musical Society, SCD. But I would like to talk about the collective management in general in Latin America. My first remark is uh, we have a very powerful collective management activity in Latin America. Here you have a map of the different societies we have, the musical societies. Uh, well, you have a, a lot of musical societies in Brazil. My, my friend Roberto Melo will explain about that. And in the, the other countries, we have a one society per country. Uh, the music and dramatic works other group of society, dramatic and audiovisual societies, and still imagine societies, many. In the neighborhood rights, only in artists, uh, performers, uh, we have uh, 14 societies, very big activity. And uh, then the conclusion is we have 39 collective management societies of the rights, 14 collective management societies of neighboring rights, six rights organization of reprographic rights. Um, Scott said that uh, it's necessary to cooperate between our societies in the world of copyright. And I would like to explain what we think that this kind of cooperation is necessary to, uh, to implement in our region. Uh, the first is uh, we need uh, on the net with the authors, the artists and the cultural industry. This is the first uh, system of cooperation. Information, transparency, transparency and uh, unfortunately in the, in the slide it says money because all of you speak about information transparency transparency but what about the money are you looking for transparency information or are you looking for money I understand that it's necessary the three elements but uh, money is very important and sometimes I heard that uh, if you have a very good amount of money you forget about transparency and information <laughs> Okay, information, it means documentation, collection, and distribution. I would like only to, uh, ex to, to illustrate about what, what are we doing in my society, in SCD, about the information. Here you have a, an, an author, composer, and performer, Pablo Herrera, a very famous, uh, very known uh, artist in Latin America, not only in my country. He has the possibility to have a password and to go to the, our database and he can check uh, his information, his own data, his uh, works, and of course his, uh, his distribution statement. Is this good information? I think it is. But not only that, Transparency. Well, when we refer that transparency is necessary, I don't know if we are talking about transparency, transparency in general. 
Because I am asking my clients, what about your transparency? The transparency of the users, not only the transparency of the societies. Well, we love transparency. For that reason, we got a certificate of the, uh, the norm ISO 9001-2000, and uh, we got an international certification about our process management. Here you have our work. This is a chart about the different process that we have to do in our society. Very complex activities. I don't like to bore you about this, uh, this, this difficult uh, job, but uh, I only want to tell you that well, no, the chart is not possible to, to open, but we have 37, 37 management, 37 process uh, from the from the beginning of uh, one author in the society and for the beginning of uh, license for and the end of course of the distribution 37 process uh, 37 process and all of them certificated by an external auditors that certificate that we are in a correct way doing our work. We have three uh, uh, external audit, uh, uh, sorry, two internal auditors about our process and one external auditor per year. Per year. Transparency is a good word for us. And of course, our financial statements are audited by a multinational uh, enterprise. Ernst and Young, and we can offer to all of you our statement. You can check it, and all our expenses are there, and our revenues, of course. What about money? This is, it is uh, the calendar that, uh, about our uh, distribution. In this calendar, you can find exactly the date when we give the money to our uh, members. Here you have a distribution statement for Pablo Herrera. If you look at here, it is not only one page, maybe more pages. A very detailed statement about his rights. Because our member think that sometimes it's not important the money but it's very important to know where their works are performed. The third and the last one, system of cooperation, is solidarity and interoperability. Here we are talking about our national situation. We have six societies, six collective administration societies in Still image, music, recording performance, literary works, theater, cinema, audiovisuals, and audiovisual performance. Uh, I would like to read very briefly why we are working together. First, because we think that the big chance to reunite the world culture in its national universe in the field of the intellectual property rights as a formidable, valuable model in the organized civil society. The integration of every asset of intellectual property of the cultural sector in an information system which incorporates the data of artistic works and creation of the country. Third is the development of scales economies in benefit of the activity of the collective management organizations and their members. Fourth, the suppression of every form of marginality in the defense of the authors and protection of the works in all the artistic expression. And finally, the documentation and identification of every creation 
and national artistic production as the only alternative to their administration in the field of the electronic transfer of works. We think that this solidarity in each country is very important and we think that uh, it's necessary to improve in this internal or national solidarity. We work together, we cooperate with each other, we think that uh, this position of the societies in our country is a very good form to be powerful in front of the authorities and parliaments and uh, the judiciary system. Well, in, in the level of international level, of course, the Global Information Network, CISNET, is a very good option for us. Maybe tomorrow uh, we will have an, an information of that. And I only want to uh, end my presentation to show you uh, our, uh, our net in Latin America with this uh, model of uh, interoperability and solidarity between, uh, between the, uh, the, the Latin American societies. Here, mm -hmm. maybe it doesn't work in this computer. Sometimes it occurs, but uh, uh, believe me that uh, it's, it, it is a very truly um, system, and uh, in this uh, system we can get all our works in um, all our uh, repertoire in only one net. We can offer uh, good information for uh, uh, our members, our societies, we can uh, show a very clean repertoire with uh, correct information, with correct textures of the, uh, of the different uh, uh, old uh, uh, rights in, the, in, in each work. And uh, uh, because my friend uh, Scott is uh, looking at the, his uh, watch, I would like to end my presentation to say that it's very important for us that you understand that we are working correctly with um, very, enthusiast very enthusiastic in this, uh, in this system and um, in Latin America uh, we are facing the challenge of the new times. Thank you. Thank you very much Santiago and I think yeah, SCD is a, a really good example of a transparent and efficient society and also the example of Latinet is a really important example of how cooperation between societies can assist in actually compiling repertoire that is common and shared and um, to make that works information available to the rest of the world through CISNET. So it's really important. And perhaps now I could call on Roberto Mejo, to, who is the uh, president of Abramos, which is one of, I think, or 11 societies that exist in Brazil. Brazil is an interesting country to look at in terms of how collective management has developed, but the solutions you have made with having a centralized licensing organization, a CUD, so if you could perhaps present to us. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you to WIPO for the invitation. Thank you, CISAC, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, I speak Portuguese in Brazil, my second language is French. Then I apologize for eventual mistakes in my presentation to you. Uh, but uh, we have a, a different system in Brazil. We are six societies. Six societies doing the same. I don't say that they do the same, but they have the same objective. is to collect the collection of performing rights. Well, uh, I listen all the, the, the reportings here, I listen to the speakers, and I verified that there are some problems relating to the new scenery, to the new situation all over the world. But in Brazil, in 1977, 
uh, we constituted a Central Bureau for Collection of Rights, named ECADI, as the Central Bureau for Collection of Performing Rights. All the policy, all the documentation and the distribution is done by the societies that in charge ECADI as the Bureau to collect before the users. According to Brazilian constitution, and I believe is the constitutions all over the world have the same or similar dispositions, everybody may choose the society the people would like it to be in. In Brazil, you can choose the society you'd like to be in and to maintain in the society or the change of society. But the six societies of Brazil, 30 years ago, decided to have a joint collection. Joint collection of what? Of auto rights and of neighboring rights together. They decide to have a partition, a key of partition between those rights. You have two thirds of auto rights and you have one third of neighboring rights. This one third of neighboring rights is split between the phonographic producers, the performers and the musicians. As in Brazil, the ISRC is obliged, the, the phonographic companies are obliged to produce uh, an ISW, uh, ISRC code to, to, to make a, a phonogram. It's easier for us because if we document everything, we should make the proper partition between the author rights and the neighboring rights. We have here a, a short presentation to show you how this. Uh, our society, Brazilian Society of Music and Art, was born in 1982 from the initiative of a group of musicians. Initially, well, were 120 musicians and only for neighboring rights. Initially, was only responsible for the rights of such group and grew to aggregate authors, composers, publishers, performers, and phonographic producers. We count now with 75 employees in the five major cities in Brazil, São Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, Curitiba, Porto Alegre, Salvador, and Recife. Abramos is the largest society in Brazil, of the six society, and we manage or co-manage ECAD in the General Assembly. In the General Assembly of ECAD, we, we discuss uh, questions relating to distributions, questions relating to collections, questions relating to policies, questions relating to how to, to document how to develop systems, how to do the proper, the proper documentation in order to have a correct distribution before, uh, between the participants. The societies are then responsible for all the decisions and the General Assembly take all the actions and decide everything related to the destination of the way of ECADI to, to, to work. ECADI is the sole collector of public performance music rights revenue in Brazil and it collects both author and neighboring rights, as I told you before. Music users include all and any individual or organization use music in a public contest, such as promoters of public events, concerts, circles, gyms, cinemas, broadcasters, radio broadcasters, TV broadcasters. They have a, a little difficult, we have a little bit difficult with TV broadcasters. They refuse a little bit to pay, but we are going ahead. Bars, restaurants, hotel, etc. Now you see our increase of collection. We have, we are in a very hard job in order to increase our activity. This year of 2007, we will achieve a, a, approximately 150 million dollars of collection of performing rights. It's a very good development of the work of the societies, and this is a kind of negotiation we have of all the users in order to have better and better uh, uh, collection for the authors and the other owners of author rights and neighboring rights. 100% of collection is distributed. 75% go to the owners, to the authors, to the composers, to the publishers, to the producers, to the performers and to the musicians. The societies remain with 7% as the fee for the administration. And the cost of a card, the cost for operation is 18%. Then we have a total value of expense of 25%. And the 75% the remaining balance is paid to the authors and the other participants. As I told you, the revenue share 
the revenue share is split at 66.6% to the others and 33.4% to the neighboring rights. Foreign revenue is collected through bilateral or unilateral agreements signed by each society. I was listening to John when he told that he paid uh, some amounts to Brazilian performers, that's right, and did not receive exactly. He has no contract. And I told him, you, you need to have a contract. You, you, if you don't have a bilateral agreement, it's impossible to receive. Oh, okay, it's a good idea. No, it's not a good idea. It's an obligation. We have to have a bilateral agreement. And we will go ahead. I told John, and probably we will, we will enter into this, this agreement very soon. Uh, Abramos represent the repertoire of 23 foreign societies in Brazil, and we uh, has its repertoire represented by 60 societies abroad along the world. Every society is responsible for its own documentation. Abramos is now the major society, is responsible for 70% of the works and 85% of tracks registered in Brazil. We do this job day by day, and we produce approximately 400 works per day. We document 400 per day work and 500 uh, phonograms per day. That represents around, around 16, uh, 180 works per month and four 130 tracks per month on behalf of 13.500 members of Abramos. And then you have how we do. We have CWR, very well developed. Uh, we receive CWR for the, the, the publishers all over the world. And we have manual. Manual, we are talking about uh, things, that are, works that are produced in Brazil, not related to the majors, to the independent companies that would like to be documented in Abramos too. Uh, it's a hard job but we are doing very well, and that's the reason we are, because we have an increase of distribution of 42% last year. Phonograms, as I told you, we have registrations and we have alterations. Which alterations? Sometimes we have conflicts, conflicts of uh, who is the owner of the phonogram, or when you have a co-production, we have to author, and that's one of the reasons of what we have people in charge only of operations of phonograms. That's very important for us too. Our system and database, we have ISRCs mandatory in Brazil, that's very good, because we have appointed the song, the author, the composer, the publisher, the phonographic producer, the, the performer, and the musicians, and everybody will receive their respective amount. And we have ISWC, the International Standard Work Code, documented together, facilitated distribution. And you see, it's easier for us if we have IS, ISRC and ISWC together, it's easier to document everything. Everything is done electronically using tools like CWR, IPI, CISNET. We are developing now a CADINET, and probably next year, CADINET will be online for everybody. Our confederations that we participate, we participate of CISAC, obviously, SCAPR for, for the performers, and FILAIA for the producers. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> excuse me, for the, for the performance of America. We have also other revenues. Revenues not come from a country for, for ourselves, for our activities. We are the largest society in grand rights from dramatics. We represent authors from Brazil, we have the major authors of grammatics in Brazil, and we represent societies all over the world, like SACD from France, SGAI in Spain, CI in Italy, SBA in Portugal, SSA Suisse, Agadu in Uruguay, RAO in Russia, Argentores in Argentina, as well as negotiations with agents in USA and in Europe. We have, there are two years, incorporated another society, Altivis. Altivis is a society for visual arts. We are talking about painters, photographers, sculptors, designers, web artists, etc. And then you see that we are a society, except for literature, we, we deal with many subjects. Music, audiovisual, as I will talk to you, uh, dramatics, and uh, visual arts. 
We have entered into an agreement with Izan, Izania in Geneva, uh, in March of this year, and now we are uh, the society in charge of making all the identification and number of audiovisual work using the international standard audiovisual number for all the Brazilian producers. And that's our presentation, our simple presentation, but I believe that this kind of model should be profitable for the societies that are viewing a new summary for auto rights all over the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roberto. Yes, I think um, Abramos is a really interesting example of how uh, rights holders in musical works and neighboring rights can actually work together. And I think the one-third, two-third split that was decided, I understand, quite a while ago is quite interesting. In terms of our cooperation with neighboring rights collectors, we do issue some joint licenses, uh, not so much in the online area, mostly because the major record companies haven't been so forthcoming in terms of licensing online rights. Um, but I think also we're seeing a, a trend now in terms of applications to our copyright tribunal by the neighboring rights organization where they're seeking much greater uh, rights than, than, than or much greater levels of royalties and tariffs than relate to um, the rights in musical works. But I, I'd like to now continue the, the theme of regional cooperation in particular and, and turn now to the Caribbean. My friend Alison Damas, who's the Chief Executive Officer of COP, the copyright organization of Trinidad and Tobago. And I think, you know, in terms of the development of COP, which is probably one of the, more, the most important societies in the Caribbean, and how you assist all of the other societies in the other territories, is a really good example, particularly even where there may be common law and author's rights systems that operate in those territories, but are still able to cooperate both in terms of developing IT resources and also addressing things such as cross-border online licensing. So I'll pass you over to, uh, to Alison to, to explain the situation in the Caribbean. Thank you very much, Scott, and good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for staying the course. I have the honor of being the first female speaker today. <laughs> All right, but I'm sure there may be some of you in the room who have no idea where the Caribbean is. So let me just make sense. Yes, I know we're small, but we are significant. So the Caribbean is an arc of islands extending from just off the southern tip of Florida with um, Bahamas down to my country, Trinidad, which is just off the northern coast of Venezuela. And for the purpose of, the, of this discussion, it also includes Belize, which is on the mainland of Central America, and Guyana and Suriname, which are part of South America. So I think because we are uh, essentially um, small islands, small territories, it's only natural that we cooperate. And in fact, it's interesting because we have attempted cooperation in other areas, for example, political federation, which failed, uh, economic cooperation, which had limited success, but it seems as if in the area of collective management, we've actually succeeded in cooperation. Now, the idea for pan-Caribbean cooperation had some while in gestation. I think the first documented um, advocating of such a need was in the late 1980s by Dennis De Freitas, the late Dennis De Freitas, who is considered to be the godfather of copyright sales in the Anglophone Caribbean. And this was a project, the Caribbean Music Industry Development Project, which was commissioned by UNESCO. And essentially he advocated that, especially in the area of distribution and documentation, there was a need for us to, to pool resources. However, it wasn't until 10 years later, um, thanks to WIPO, where at an interministerial meeting with ministers in the Caribbean region responsible for intellectual property, that they mandated WIPO to come up with a regional system for collective management. And this gave rise to Caribbean Copyright Link, um, CCL, which is essentially a grouping of the societies in the Caribbean. Now, one of the things about the Caribbean, not just the fact that we're small, we're rather complex, and there are several reasons for this. And one of the reasons, I think, is because of our historical and legal past. 
So we are a mixture of peoples from all over the world. Um, the first peoples of the Caribbean were the Caribs and Arawaks, um, virtually annihilated by the Spanish conquistadors. But we have people of African, Indian descent, European descent, Chinese, um, Syrian, and Lebanese. So can you imagine, we have a, like a microcosm of the entire world in this um, tiny hot seat in the Caribbean. And this is very much um, reflective of, the, if you look at the development of collective management, because it's very much tied to our historical past. So you find that in the Anglophone Caribbean, we had the PRS, which still continues to operate. And in the Spanish, we had Sky. Um, in the Dutch Antilles, um, we have Buma, Samra. And then in the French Caribbean, we have um, Sasem. And even in, when we gained political independence, um, we were still dependent on um, these other societies for our collective management. It's interesting that the first collective management organization uh, established was my organization, COT, Corporate Organization of Trinidad Tobago. And this was established virtually simultaneously with the first national uh, legislation in the Caribbean, the Corporate Act of Trinidad Tobago of 1985. Because prior to that, we all fell under either the um, 1911 Corporate Act of the UK or the, or the 1956 Act. And in fact, it was not until maybe 10 years after that we had the development and emergence of societies in the other Caribbean-speaking islands. So for example, it's interesting that Jamaica, even though uh, Jamaica's reggae music had gained international success, it wasn't until 1998 that we had the establishment of Jacob the Jamaica Association of Composers, Authors, and Publishers. And this was closely followed with um, organizations in Barbados and St. Lucia. Um, Barbados had the distinction of being the first um, island in the Caribbean that had a neighboring rights organization, initially called BAMC, which was then changed to CARA. And then recently, the Authors' Right Organization, COSCAP, began to also administer related uh, rights. Now we have several challenges. Um, because we are small in size, um, obviously we face competition from the larger societies. We have situations where our certainly well-known songwriters, particularly in Jamaica, of course are members of ASCA, BMI, or PRS. And it's very difficult to persuade them, you know, um, to leave PRS, BMI, ASCA, and to join JCA. Uh, we have problems in our legal system. Um, comforted by the fact that we're not alone, I'm told, by Javier Asensio. We have long delays in our legal system. For example, we were the first society in the Caribbean to bring action against the cable operators who refused to pay. Uh, this action was taken since 2002, and up to now the matter has not yet been heard in court. So this is quite typical. We have delays in our judicial system. We have the attitude of our magistrates and judges who feel, for example, that piracy, which is rampant, that the pirates have a right to make a living. Okay. <laughs> they view them as small businesses. This was actually recorded in the session, that small businessmen have a right to make a living. So you know, that is the kind of attitude we have to deal with. Also, because we are small, we find that, of course, um, that's about government ministers have you know, private interests in broadcasting stations, etc., so, of course, when we come to license them, you know, we're looked at as the sort of bad wolves. Um, we also have a history of recalcitrance. Um, people don't understand the concept of copyright. So when our licensing reps turn up of restaurants and bars, sometimes they are physically threatened. A um, couple of occasions, people actually set, you know, dogs on them. Um, you know, guns have been pulled on them. So it's a really uphill struggle. But we have judges in this also. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but notwithstanding all those challenges, um, what we have found is that by cooperating, we have come up with common solutions. And one such area is in the area of cross border licensing. In fact, it's interesting that even before the EU Commission launches an attack on CSAC member societies, um, in terms of online music licensing. Um, in 2004, uh, we issued a joint license to a Dominican ringtone provider, um, Picks and Phones. Uh, they provided ringtones to one of our major telecoms companies, um, Cable and Wireless. 
And what we did is essentially the four founding members of CCL, that's um, Cotton Tunan Tobago, Coscap in Barbados, JCAP in Jamaica, and HS, HMS in St. Lucia, we issued a joint license which covered all our territories. And what we had is that CCL acted as the bank deposit, so the royalties were paid to CCL, and then the royalties were distributed to, through our back office to our various societies. And then, effective 1st of January 2005, thanks to Joan McGivern of ASCAP, we were actually able to negotiate, that is cut, we negotiated with ASCAP for them to give us the right to license their repertoire throughout the entire Caribbean basin. And having obtained those rights, it was easy for COT to then leverage with the other societies who then gave COT the rights to license their repertoire across the Caribbean. Right now, we're in negotiations with PRS um, for the same, and that's going to be a reciprocal agreement. So PRS will represent our repertoire um, across, across Europe. And we're hoping to do the same with BMI and SOCAN, um, their repertoire being you know, the most performed repertoire in um, our region. The challenge is in relation to mechanical rights. And that is because, again, because we are considered such a small market, we actually don't have any of the major publishers being represented or having even a presence in our region. However, that is changing. Just before they were taken over by Terra Firma, EMI Music Publishing actually applied to COT to become a member. And that is quite significant, and uh, we hope to be able to <coughs> conclude that negotiation, which will at least give us a first step with a major, and we should be able to uh, clear the mechanical rights. And once we do that with EMI, then we'll approach the other majors so that we'll acquire the mechanical rights to actually be able to effectively administer online licensing on a pan-Caribbean basis. Another example of uh, cooperation was in the area of uh, sports licensing. Um, this year, the, for those of you familiar with cricket, which is kind of similar to baseball, the International Cricket Council um, held its uh, World Cup in the Caribbean, and this in fact was the biggest sporting event held in the Caribbean. And again, by cooperating, CCL was able to negotiate with PRS. So PRS appointed us as its agent, and we licensed the music that was performed at the ICC matches that were in the, performed at the, uh, in the PRS territories in the Caribbean as well, of course, we license in our territories. And apart from music rights, through the Caribbean Media Corporation, which administers broadcast rights, they were given the exclusive broadcast rights by the ICC. And again, we were able to license the public communication of broadcast in our territories. So this provided a significant amount of the additional revenue, um, which was unbudgeted for and quite, um, was quite welcome. So these are some of the areas in terms of licensing where we have cooperated. Uh, we also cooperate in terms of training. Again, thanks um, to WIPO, who has provided tremendous assistance in terms of um, human resource training, in terms of um, providing us with the initial hardware and, and software, and facilitating an agreement with Sky, whereby um, they license um, for our use um, the SGS, which um, Santiago mentioned is used in Latin America. Um, we've also cooperated through CSAC and CSAC member societies such as um, SOCAN and ASCAP. We've had training in terms of general licensing, media licensing, um, field licensing, um, and we hope soon to have in the area of mechanical licensing coming up soon, and of course in documentation and distribution. So although the initial purpose for which CCL was established was documentation and distribution, and there have been challenges. I think the major challenge is that we operated on the assumption that we could just have one person operating a back office, but we realized that that is impossible, and in fact we have come up now with an actual plan in cooperation with Sky, whereby we're going to um, be in the process of recruiting, and we hope to have actually um, six persons running that office. We're also planning to expand collective administration to the rest of the region. Uh, we recently welcomed uh, Sassu in Suriname. 
Biscap in Belize, and I'm pleased to hear that our friends from Haiti have recently formed an uh, organization there, and we will welcome them into CCL. And we also plan to expand CCL into the PRS territories. We've been negotiating with PRS now for about a year, and we are optimistic by the end of the year we will be able to convince PRS that we can do a much better job than they have done um, in the Anglophone Caribbean. So things are looking up. Um, there are lots of challenges, but like I said, through our history of cooperation, we are moving forward. Uh, we are more than just a back office. We are a movement. Uh, we uh, liaise with each other on a daily basis. You know, we have common solutions for our common problems. And the sun is rising on CCL. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Alison. Yes, yeah, CCL is a, a wonderful initiative um, of WIPO and of the societies in the region with the assistance of the developed societies as well, like Sabaya and PRS. And I think those sort of initiatives are really important in terms of allowing you to effectively uh, administer the rights in a cost-effective way because without that, you can't do it. And the other thing I heard you very clearly was about the judges and training of the judges. And this is where WIPO and CZAC also assist in terms of awareness raising and, and training the judiciary as to the nature of the rights. One of the issues I remember in the Philippines in our negotiations with the, the broadcasters was we were told that even though we had the rights and we had a good case, that if we went to court, we would lose. So <coughs> you have to look at the judiciary in certain territories and how it operates and Perhaps now we should turn to how it operates very well in Canada and the role of the Copyright Board, because we have Mario Bouchard, who's the General Counsel of the Copyright Board of Canada, who I'd love to, to call on to talk a little bit about development of copyright uh, at collective administration in Canada, and in particular the role of the board and how it supervises and brings together and fosters cooperation between copyright societies in licensing and setting towns. Thanks, Mario. Yes, I have, suppose I have to start by admitting to, given the composition of the rest of this panel, that I am, I am on the dark side, <laughs> but not to worry. Uh, yes, I am part of a, one of those uh, organizations that uh, supervise certain aspects of collective administration in Canada. Um, collective administration in Canada goes back a long time. CPRS, uh, PRO, first PRO was created in 1924, uh, and uh, the Copyright Appeal Board, the predecessor of my institution, was set up in 1936 uh, solely to uh, monitor the work, the, the work of the PRS. So really, it was created uh, to deal with what was considered to be a potential abuse of monopoly power. The situation remained the same until 1988, where three things happened. A new copyright board with some permanent staff was set up. Uh, collective administration was legitimized in the Copyright Act uh, through certain provisions which allowed it to function with, at, without so much supervision from the part of the competition authorities. And a compulsory licensing scheme was set up uh, uh, for the retransmission of distant broadcast and television signals, uh, in which sector we have eight active collectives but only one parent. Uh, in 1993, the board, looking at the evolution uh, of the legislation, uh, concluded that its role was no longer to be there solely to protect users against the abuse of monopoly powers on, on the part of the, the CMOs, but in fact to ensure that there was a balance in the market uh, between the CMOs and the users, and that balance was switched depending on the power on the side of the users, and that decision was sustained uh, by uh, our courts of law. 1997 saw further amendment to the legislation which further encouraged a collective administration. Uh, neighboring rights owners, uh, we'll call them for for the sake of simplicity, uh, were given a remuneration right that had to be exercised through a collective society. 
the general regime, which allowed only arbitration and case-by-case -case licensing to occur, was amended so that, as to give CMOs the option of filing a tariff like the PROs uh, were allowed. And we also had a private copy of the site in place. All of this was under the supervision of the Copyright Board. 1999, first private copy of the tariff. 1999, first neighboring rights tariff for the use of the sound recordings uh, on the radio. 2001, if I remember well, first filing of an optional tariff uh, the, led to the adoption eventually of uh, a tariff for the reproduction of musical works by radio stations. That tariff is administered by an administrative entity that was created by the two collective societies that we have active in Canada in that respect, CMRA and SODRA. Uh, two quite different societies that function quite differently, but we decide to strike a strategic alliance in that particular market, and that's the way it happened. 2003, and here I'm beginning to deal with this issue of, fra of fragmentation, and I'll come back to that. The board decided to hear together the SOCAN tariff for uh, the performance of musical works and the NRCC tariff for the performance of sound recordings, the remuneration rights, with respect to commercial radio and concluded that it should impose a single tariff applicable to both societies. NRCC challenged that and lost in court our power to do so as part of terms and conditions was confirmed. Um, further uh, filings of uh, voluntary tariffs continued. CSI filed a tariff again jointly for the reproduction of musical works in uh, by online music services. In 2006, we also certified the first SOCAN ringtone tariff. Today, we wanted recent developments a couple of hours ago. We issued uh, the first decision that deals with the performing rights for the SOCAN tariffs over the internet, uh, dealing specifically with the same portfolio of uses as we dealt in the reproduction right in CSI online. And that decision was to set a single price for permanent downloads, limited downloads, and on-demand streams of 12.2% for the bundle of reproduction and communication right, but to achieve different distributions depending on the relative importance of the works. In November, we will be hearing the first satellite radio tariff, or should I say tariffs, because there will be now three tariffs being examined all at the same time. The SOCAN tariff, communication of the work. The NRCC tariff, communication of the sound recording. And the CSI tariff, reproduction of the work. Subject to a ver variety of regimes, but will be examined all together. And in fact, some of the filings indicate that collective societies intend to take a global approach to the assessment of music. They will try and demonstrate to the board that music on satellite radio, in all of its aspects, in all of its fragments, when you put them all together, is worth so much, and that the various elements of it are worth so much within that area. But of course, as you might notice, the uh, right to reproduce the master of the sound recording is, has not been mentioned yet because it's not been put on the table. AVLA and SOPROC, you know, the collectives that manage this right, have never filed for a tariff before the board until this spring. We filed a tariff for the reproduction of sound recordings on commercial radio. So now the board is currently seized of four separate tariffs representing the four fragments that radio stations need to operate in order to play recorded, pre-recorded music. And we have a motion which is under advisement from the radio, from the, uh, the Association of Broadcasters to hear these four tariffs all at the same time. Why did I put uh, that story in that way? It was, I think, to show you that the super agency is one way of dealing with the problem of fragmentation of rights. But 
that there are other ones. Fragmentation of copyright, just if I may say as an aside, is both essential and a pain. If I buy a CD and I don't own a restaurant, I don't want to be forced to buy the license to play it in the restaurant. So fragmentation for me is good. But if I'm a radio station and I have to negotiate for different prices, quite frankly, if the price is regulated, I'd rather go before the regulator and say, tell me how much I have to pay, and then the societies can decide how to split And if they can't, you keep talking to them. I'm not interested in that part. That's exactly what happens in retransmission with eight societies. They will come with different proofs of different values for, for how to do the repartition, uh, the, the, the ventilation or whatever you want to call it. But we set one price for the whole, the whole portfolio, and that way the retransmitters know off the bat how much they're going to have to pay. Um, you can see that over the last decade, the role of the copyright board has increased quite a bit. Uh, I'm taking from the fact that the number of tariffs that are being filed by so collective societies that don't have to file tariffs is an indication that either collecting is absolutely dead impossible and negotiation is just dead impossible, or we're not doing such a bad job. Uh, I don't know which is the answer. Um, there are strong pressures on the part of users who ensure that they can, I hate that ex expression, but anyway, they can one-stop shop. It's not always possible. We've achieved it in a couple of instances, uh, and the market has accepted it. It's important to understand when we're talking about the Canadian Copyright Board though, that it is uh, in a bit of a zone of its own in certain respects, uh, if you compare it with uh, other similar American institutions. Those institutions like the Copyright Tribunal in, in Australia or Singapore or England tend to be, A, understaffed, if at all staffed. If I remember well, uh, the Australian Tribunal has one-tenth of a person year or something like that. Uh, we are huge compared to them. We're 13. Um, and the other thing is we are not as judicialized as they are. Uh, our members tend to be lawyers but don't have to be. We've had economists. We've had uh, business persons. We've, got, we've had a variety of people who came from the broadcast side of things. So we've had a variety of people. Um, and we tend to be uh, much more uh, attentive to the uh, economic aspects of various situations we're faced with. I think that's about as much as I need to say because there might be some questions, especially if we do Thank you very much, yeah, and I'm sure there will be questions. Thank you, Mario. And can I just say I'm very happy about that announcement about the combined online rate today because, of course, APRA and AMCOS have initiated a proceeding to determine the rate combined of communication and reproduction in our copyright tribunal. And I was just going to ask you about the role of good old common law role of precedent in terms of copyright tribunal and how we look. And, and, and thinking also of... of you know, the, the PRS recent decision, PRS NCPS decision, where it was the digital service providers and record companies in the Copyright Tribunal before uh, over the same sort of time. But we live in, in what I suppose may be a bit of a, a, a weird uh, legal environment in Canada. Uh, first of all, I should add, we're not bound by the rules of evidence. Uh, in fact, if we thought we were, we would be illegal, we would be acting illegally. Uh, and we're also not bound by our precedents. If we follow them rigidly, again, we're acting illegally. We're looking for some consistency, of course, but uh, that is not always possible. Uh, as far as international precedents are concerned, they are informative no more. Our experience has taught us that the markets, the way they function, uh, the way they've been structured over time, uh, are often just too different. You don't understand enough about the local history, but they are informative. For example, in the decision we issued today, when we look at the relative ratios of the two rights, we give the CSAC recommended ratios to give an illustration 
of what other people think about it. Um, in uh, other cases, uh, we will take evidence about the foreign rates to give us some sort of a ballpark. I know that in CSI, uh, I think it was in ringtones, that we looked at clusters to see where where this thing was located as some sort of a, of a comfort test. So those are the ways uh, we can use it. Thank you, Mario. I might open it up. Also, CSI, I think, is crime scene investigation. No, no. CMRA. Sorry, that's just my American television upbringing. Sorry. No, it's uh, CMRA Sodrak Inc. Ah, sorry. Thank you. And we'll hear probably more about that from David as well tomorrow. But please, I'd like to open it up now to questions. We've had a good overview of the region. Up the back, please. Yes, uh, questions for Alice and Damas. Uh, Mr. Damas, as each of the islands in the Caribbean that uh, have their own rights societies, as they evolved, did each of them get dispensation from PRS? Did I take your microphone? Forgive me. Yeah, yeah, give, give it back. Oh. So yes, um, the release is given from the society who is administering the particular right in the territory. But did each of them petition individually? So like uh, Jamaica petition PRS, then yeah. St. Lucia? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. How long a process was that for them, do you know? Um, well, like I said, they were formed at, at different times. Mm -hmm. um, so the only collective petition that we have is actually now, as I mentioned, we are collectively petitioning uh, the PRS to, um, for them to relinquish administration in the Eastern Caribbean, which will, of course, include Anguilla. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Please. Um, Allison, will the PRS deal you're talking about, is that strictly for performing rights, or since they're now with MCPS, will it help, uh, help with mechanical as well? No, um, that's strictly PRS. Um, we want to do a similar arrangement with the MCPS, but of course, in the case of the MCPS, the publishers tend to retain control over the mechanical rights, which is why I mentioned we're going to go directly to the major publishers, and we've already started with EMI, as I mentioned. And what's the situation with record labels? I, I would assume the market down there is uh, as small for them as it is for publishers. Are they there, or do, is there a collective agency? I, I, again, um, there are no major uh, labels represented in the Caribbean. Um, there are two um, active um, organizations. There's Coscap and Barbados, which deals with related rights, and there is a recently established um, organization in Jamaica. Javi, I can't remember the name. Jams. Yeah? I was also just in the interim going to comment about uh, further to the, the reproduction rights and online stuff in Asia that the majors have actually now entered into agency agreements with uh, performing rights societies like Cash in Hong Kong, Compass in Singapore. MACP in Malaysia. So on an experimental basis now, they're actually granting reproduction rights so that the society can issue joint online licenses in those territories. And societies in the Asia-Pacific region have joined together and issued the first experimental license to download service out of Hong Kong into all of our territories. Now, your question. Hi, um, my name's Peter Filio. I'm representing the European Sound Directors Association, which hasn't got a uh, really uh, a direct connection to my questions to Roberto and also to Alison. I, I, I found their presentations really refreshing in, in, in the light of what we've heard today. Um, especially the notion, Roberto, first of all, of, of the fact that, that you have a joint license with, with, with neighboring rights organizations. I wondered whether there were, before that was in place, there was a, a network of music publishers who were a little protective about the, the former revenues that, that they've had in, in their particular area. And, and to Alison, just to get the questions out of the way, 
Um, given the, the lack of understanding of a copyright culture in, in Little Caribbean Islands, um, would it be possible for um, CCL to develop a joint license rather than to go back to people and say, right, we persuaded you to, to, to pay a, um, a musical works license. Oh, and by the way, there's also this other one that's for neighboring rights. Would that be useful? talk a little bit about the, the history of the auto rights in Brazil. You don't have copyright laws, you have auto rights. This is a bit different because this is an anthropocentrical view of the city. Because this is an anthropocentrical view how to defend the owners of the rights. Voilà. Oui. Excuse me. Okay. Excuse me for this. Okay. Uh, we have author rights. Author rights, with this anthropocentric view of understanding the right, uh, it's easy to understand how authors and performers collect together. Before this decision, 30 years ago, there was no purpose for, uh, for collecting uh, neighboring rights. The law was addicted in 1973, nine, uh, law number 5988. Five, and after this, the societies, there were at that time 10 or 12 societies, uh, decided that they should make some coalitions in order to have these this rights. The societies became societies, plural societies, because we have authors in any society. We have authors, and the authors have some published companies, personal published companies from them, and they are performers too. Sometimes they are the, the, the producers uh, in the scenery of today. We see a lot of people producing themselves their own production of, of performances. Then, now it's a, a very peculiar situation because Brazil started this kind of, of uh, system 30 years ago. 30 years ago we had problems relating to conflicts, we're relating to titularities to see who is the owner of the, of the song, who is the performer, who is the producer. Now we don't have any more because this, the system is totally integrated. And then we should verify who is the owner of each right. Uh, I believe that it was very smart from Brazil uh, to sit everybody together and to, to talk with the, the producers, to talk with the publishers, to see, well, we have something to share, but we should share better if we act, we act together. And that we are doing. 30 years we are doing the same with very good results. Thank you. Very refreshing. Yes, um, in relation to uh, CCL, um, certainly all the societies administer both mechanical and uh, performing rights. And in terms of our expansion, we are advocating um, both rights. The difficulty in terms of neighboring rights is our legislation and the fact that it's only in Jamaica, um, Barbados, they're signatories to um, the WPPT and in fact Barbados was a signatory to Rome. Um, the trouble, for example, in Toronto Tobago is that we are not signatory to any of the um, neighboring rights um, conventions. And essentially because we are a common law system, um, unless we are signatories um, to these international conventions, it means that, for example, foreign sound recorders are not protected in our country, and there's no protection in other countries for our performers and, and producers of, of sound recordings. So certainly, uh, those islands in the Eastern Caribbean, I think it's only um, St. Lucia that's a signatory to WPPT, we also advocate um, neighboring rights as well. But that's a difficulty um, where that right is concerned. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, I have to add that, that uh, in my country it's the same. We, we collect uh, together the uh, author rights and, uh, and uh, uh, the recording performance rights and the producer uh, uh, rights. And we have an agreement with the producers, my friends, they are over there. And we have uh, an agreement that uh, we renew each three years and um, uh, it's the same in other uh, Latin American countries. Uh, we have uh, 
separate tariff for author rights and for neighborhood rights, but we collect together all the same rights. But uh, it's a strain, it's very rare that uh, we have a very good relationship with uh, producers, but the publishers uh, don't give us the mechanical rights. The, they only give us the performing rights, but mechanical rights, they work, uh, uh, it, especially the, the majors, work separately. And I think it's uh, not a good uh, solution for a very small market, but uh, we hope that in the future maybe the things will change. Thanks, Santiago. Are there any more questions? We'll have to wrap it up fairly soon. Yes, please. Hi, my name is Gauri Nanakara, and I work for the Attorney General's Department of Sri Lanka, but um, currently I'm researching on performance rights in UK. Um, first of all, congratulations about your performances in developing the world in um, collective management. Um, coming from a country where performing rights societies are unheard of, I was just curious to know uh, what sort of, or rather who was behind in initiating performance rights societies in your experiences in your countries? Okay. Yeah. Um, well, certainly in my country, it was the, the right owners. Um, the PRS operated an agency in Trinidad and Tobago, and in fact, you know, they advocated, we want our own legislation, and the Attorney General, they, they said, okay, if you're going to get your own National Copyright Act, I want a national society. Um, and it's similar in the rest of the region. Um, it normally starts with the right owners. Um, there are some exceptions, for example, I think in, um, in Haiti, for example, it's an actual arm of, of the government. So it, it varies from territory to territory. Uh, uh, from in my society, we have a balance between the decisions are taken by a, a board of directors. We have two publishers, two authors, two musicians, and two recording companies. That's uh, the way of have a, a balanced decision. Well in, um, well, in Latin America, we have uh, very old societies. Uh, the Mexican society and uh, the Brazilian society, may, a lot of Brazilian society are very old. They have a very big experience. They started with uh, authors and publishers. And, uh, 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 but the new societies, we, are, we have new societies in Central America, especially. And in that place, uh, they have a very big support uh, coming from CSAC. CSAC has uh, a solidarity fund to support the, the new uh, societies. And WIPO cooperate with CSAC to start with new societies. This is the way that uh, we find it. I was going to, oh, yes. In Canada, yeah. Canada used to be a colony of Britain, so it's the British PRS that created it. In a first Canadian performing rights society in 25. Uh, as is APRA, but I was just going to talk about Sri Lanka a little bit in that the regional committee, the Asia Pacific Regional Committee, has looked at, and there was in fact a, a society established there called SLPRS, the Sri Lankan Performing Rights Society, but it hasn't really taken off yet. But there is discussion about what sort of sol solidarity assistance we can provide. Um, and next uh, Monday, um, I'm going to Mumbai with uh, a few other people here to have the Asia Pacific meeting to discuss strategies in the region and assistance to other societies. So next Monday we'll be in Mumbai discussing Sri Lanka. Um, any other questions just to end up? Up the back. Yes, thank you. I'm Xavier Blanc, the Association of European Performance Organizations, the organization in Europe in charge of uh, collective management of performance rights. I just want to make two remarks. Um, you, you said, Mr. Moderator, on the example of Abramus, that it was interesting to see uh, a joint collection for both performers and authors, and you say two thirds, one third, it's interesting. Yes, it's interesting, but that's not something that we would recommend. And in Europe, the collective management of performance rights is separated from the management of authors' rights. In some other continents, that's not something we discourage to have a joint collection. For instance, it can work in Latin America, and it can work 
and there are some experiences in Africa, notably. But in Europe, it does not exist, and uh, I don't want to open the debate on the sharing, but two-thirds, one-third, it may be interesting, but it's not what we would recommend, of course. And uh, my other remark is about uh, what was said by uh, Sun Exchange uh, about uh, the fact that the collecting society representing performers in Europe are reluctant uh, to, to exchange remuneration with the US performers. And it was the previous panel, but I didn't have an opportunity to, to speak. And I want to say that they are not reluctant. The problem is the legal ground for that. And in most of European countries, US performers for recording made in the US, because US performers mean nothing. A US performers, they don't have rights. They simply don't have rights, so there is nothing to exchange. And so we are not reluctant. We need a legal basis for doing that. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. And yes, certainly, I think the split uh, in terms of sharing different repertoires and joint licensing, sometimes the debate about the split, the split can become quite heated. Uh, the question is that uh, you imagine that to arrive to this kind of, of sharing, it was very difficult. We imagine that sometimes we have conflicts and we, we have some conflicts inside the General Assembly of ECAD exactly to put the things in the proper, in the proper route. Uh, this was a decision in order to comply with the interest of everybody. Uh, we decided, all the societies, all the authors represented by us, decided that we should share the rights in two-thirds for the authors and one-third for the other participants of, of, the, of the key of partition. And then you have 42% of this one-third, 42% for the producers, 42% for the performer, and 16% for the musicians. This was the way we found in order to comply with the interest of everybody. It was a political issue. Thanks, Roberto. And I think around the world there are a lot of examples of joint licenses for a, a number of different repertoires and rights holders. I'm thinking of the Holland and, and, and the cable uh, splits and things in, in Belgium and other territories. But perhaps if there are no more questions, uh, any last questions? Because I think uh, it's now time to wind up. And I'd just like to ask you to please thank our panel of experts. <laughs> And hopefully that, that sort of view of what, what's, got, what's happening in the region and different ideas and different approaches and, and different things can give you all inspiration and ideas here in the States. Thank you.